Hello and welcome to a brand new podcast, the One Stump Short Podcast. My name is Rob McGregor. Some of you may know me from the One Puck Short Podcast, the ice hockey show that I used to run, and various other places around the ice hockey world, In Goal Magazine, the Elite League, blah de blah de blah. Uh, but here I am with a brand new show, as I said, the One Stump Short short podcast it runs alongside the one stump short blog which i started up last summer uh, kind of went cold over the winter with ice hockey commitments and so forth but resurrected that yesterday finally gone through with my threat of starting a cricket podcast tonight so here we are the maiden episode of the one stump short podcast thank you all for joining me i'm currently watching hampshire try and chase kent's pretty impressive 193 uh, hampshire 30 odd for two as we speak right now. I have my Cornish Knocker Ale in my hand as well by Skinner's Brewery down in Cornwall. Um, they don't sponsor the show. I, I just like to drink beer while I do podcasts. So, uh, welcome. Enough waffling, that's 60 seconds worth of, of waffle from me. This show will be mainly focused around the English game and county championship one day cup 2020 blast uh, and of course the england test team there will be some forays into wider aspects of the international game things like the ipl and the big bash and so forth but uh, as i said made an episode and i hope you'll be joining me for well many episodes to come first little bit of news i wanted to touch on because if ever a story had prodded me into actually going through with recording a cricket podcast it was the news that Jason Gillespie has decided to take on the dairy industry now Yorkshire coach Gillespie is no stranger to sharing his vegan views of the world Uh, you know very forthright speaker as well I suppose many Australians are but Gillespie particularly so he's never been afraid to share his opinion and in an interview with the Yorkshire Post, he said, I hope one day the dairy industry can be shut down. I think it's disgusting and wrong on so many levels. Uh, now, it's interesting not because he doesn't like milk or cheese, uh, but that the Wensleydale Creamery recently signed a two-year extension of its sponsorship of Yorkshire County Cricket Club. And, yeah, it's, it's interesting to effectively call out one of your sponsors in such a way. And Gillespie did add at later in the interview that it was something out of his control. Uh, just like the fact that cricket balls are made of leather, which again, you know, cows, uh, which he's, he's not a fan of doing anything to other than uh, being nice to, which, fair enough. Uh, everybody is clearly open to their own choice of lifestyle. It's not for me personally, I'm too much of a carnivore for that, but as I said, Gillespie's never hidden his uh, vegan diet and, and his opinions of the world. And I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons I, I love Jason Gillespie as a, as a character and a lot of other people do as well, because not only has he done a great job as a Yorkshire coach, but he's also a pretty honest guy. And a lot of people can respect somebody who is as honest as that uh, when it comes to things like this, because you know, he's not minced his words. And, and he said that he'll say the same thing to anyone who challenges on it, whether it's the Wednesday Dale Creamy boss or otherwise. But I just found it kind of amusing that uh, County Cricket Coach Fights Dairy Industry was uh, was a headline. It tickled me, and as I said, it kind of pushed me over the edge on the decision on whether or not to start this podcast. So you have Jason Gillespie to thank, or curse, depending on whether you enjoy the show or not. Uh, One Day Cup is in full swing uh, in the county game right now, though there is lone 2020 game on tonight as I said Hampshire currently 47-2 they've moved on to now uh, as they look for 194 against Kent uh, but yes one day cup dominating much of the schedule right now and um, there's three 2020 games going on on Fridays and odd days as, as I said but uh, some impressive performances from some young players that's really why I brought the one day cup up Mason Crane took four for 80 for Hampshire and you know maybe 80 runs in 10 overs isn't great but Four wickets is is pretty solid effort from a young spinner who a lot of people think very well of in the game. And, you know, he has the same kind of issues that a lot of young spinners have, a little bit of control issue there and so forth. But all the signs are very promising that he could be one of the next strong, stroke, great English spinners. I hope that he can develop in something much more. And maybe one day go on to play for England. It's always an interesting little debate, the English spin position, obviously. Uh, when Ali currently holds that spot, which was kind of a curious one from the start, given that he was really largely known as a batsman during his time with Worcestershire. But he's come in, he's done very well in that role, really. And obviously, the player that he is, he lengthens the uh, English batting order as well. So he got 100 in one of the tests against Sri Lanka, which uh, we'll touch on a little bit more later on. 
but yeah, so Mason Crane uh, having a, a pretty good effort there for Hampshire. Joe Leach, two for 30, and then a cracking 63 as Worcestershire beat Yorkshire by seven wickets the other night. Again, a very impressive young man. I think he's about 25 and you know, a big year last year. And he's picked up really where he left off. And it's good for Worcestershire because they had some difficult times due to the weather. And new, then New Road ground was, was hit pretty hard by some flooding uh, in a couple of consecutive seasons. And, you know, so it's nice to see them do do well with guys like Oliveira and Leach and Chantry and Clark and so forth because they could be a very good team in a few years to come with all these young players. Uh, the other one I wanted to mention was Sam Hain, 105 not out for Warwickshire in their one day cup victory and another batsman I'm quite impressed with from what I've seen. Granted, I haven't seen a, a huge amount, but what I have seen has been impressive. And hopefully, getting to work with Ian Bell and Jonathan Trott will also help him develop his game, particularly Bell, who's obviously come back into the fold this year. Uh, after being released by England, but uh, I mean, just in general, the One Day Cup I, I think has been been pretty good. Actually, I, I wrote a piece on the One Stump Short blog yesterday to you know, partly resurrect the thing and, and just share some some personal thoughts because I'd been very indifferent to fifty over cricket for quite some time. There was endless internationals uh, and One Day internationals uh, that just left me cold because they felt more and more meaningless, and I wasn't particularly enamoured with you know the One Day Cup really prior to this year. I, I kind of missed the, the YB40 and that sort of slightly shorter format. I, I missed the old NatWest Cup where the minor counties teams were also involved because I have some quite happy memories of watching Cambridgeshire host whichever first-class county came. Uh, with speech a couple of times that happened. I remember seeing Robin Smith score a big 100 for Hampshire there in what must be about 1995, I'd I guess, but around that sort of time. Uh, and I kind of missed that, that element that had the minor counties in there. But... You know, there's been some really cracking games in the last few days. I'd say Worcestershire beat Yorkshire kind of easily in the end. It was a little bit one-sided, but there's also been some absolutely storming finishes in the competition. Somerset, an incredible effort Sunday afternoon, recovered from 198 for nine to beat Gloucestershire. They were chasing 261, so they needed another... 63 runs to win with one wicket remaining, but number 10, Jamie Overton, 40 not out. Number 11, Tim Gromwald, 34 not out to secure the victory. An incredible turnaround against the defending champions, Gloucestershire, who looked to be cruising at, at one point. Uh, equally, Knott's fantastic effort against North Hanson, I think it was Monday night, 445 for eight in there, 50 overs, largely underpinned by Michael Lum and Ricky Vessels. Uh, Lum, 184, and Vessels, 146. And... It was almost one of those things where you thought Northampton are just going to kind of fold up here. There's no way they're going to get anywhere near this. And they got 425. Partly thanks to Rory Kleinveld's 128. Adam Rossington, who's another talented young player, scoring 97. It's an incredible effort by those two teams. 870 runs, 18 wickets. That's not a bad day for, was it, 15 quid to go and watch at Trembridge. Uh, and that's kind of doing it again. It gets more actually today. 415 for five. Lumman wrestles again. Uh, Michael Lum, I think I don't know if this is right, but I'm sure I saw on Twitter that was his first hundred for knots uh, on Monday, and then he follows it up with another one today against Warwickshire. Uh, very impressive, and it's made for some exciting games because sometimes it is great to appreciate this marvelous innings that, that guys like Lum have put on. On other occasions, as I said, guys like Leach who do a little bit of everything, Crane, just to see these young guys come in. There's, there's other young players getting opportunities at counties. In the shorter formats, Livingston at, at Lancashire, and yeah, it, it's good. It's positive. It's what you want to see, really. You want to see counties using their full staff. Granted, some have less on their books than others. Northants, for example, but a lot of teams are starting to try and use their younger players, their eighteen, nineteen, twenty-year-olds who are maybe you know just on the fringes of the first team. Give them a run out in a fifty-over one-day cup game. It's a good chance to rest some of the senior players. Give them a bit of time off, or, or you know, whatever, or just take the load off, take the pressure off them a little bit. Maybe kind of like Yorkshire did in the, in the 2020 game against Lancashire. Just play someone like David Willey, who wasn't fit to bowl at that point, but you can still get him out there and, and let him have a bat and you know utilize his other skills without feeling the pinch because you haven't got enough bowlers. So yeah, positives there. A uh, couple of other little bits, or one other bit specifically uh, of county news I wanted to touch on. Hamish Marshall is going to leave Gloucestershire at the end of the season. Uh, this is his 11th season with the county. He started out as an overseas player and later moved and, and became a cold pack player. But he's 37 now. And, and he admitted that he decided to think about what to do when he retired. Uh, he's 
got an opportunity back in New Zealand, which he described as too good to turn down. Uh, he's been a fantastic servant for Gloucestershire over the years. He's got a lot of runs for him. I think he passed 7,000 list A runs in the One Day Cup game today. So hats off to him, uh, and he's had a great career both uh, on a domestic level and also internationally. He, he had a lot of good years for New Zealand as well before he came to Gloucestershire. So uh, good luck to, to Hamish Marshall in his retirement when that comes at the end of the season. Uh, of course, Graham Napier also packing in at the end of the year. So always kind of sad to see these names you, you've followed for so long in the game disappear. But uh, you know, time waits for no man in the end, apart from maybe Darren Stevens, who, who's still playing <laughs> for Kent and, and looking good again tonight in, in this 2020 game. Our third test starts later this week. England will be unchanged uh, for that contest at Lords. They lead this three-match series 2-0, and they've been pretty heavy victories at Headingley and Chesterloo Street so far. And it's it's disappointing in a sense because I remember some of the old Sri Lankan teams that came with Murali, Sangakkara, Jaya Wardner, even going back to Aravinda da Silva. They were really strong teams, and Sri Lanka aren't a poor team now, but. England have won those games so convincingly. One was by over an innings, uh, and the other was by was it nine wickets. And it's not what you want, in, in a sense, when Test cricket is kind of on that weird, shaky ground that it is right now. You, you know, you want these uh, series to to be. You need them to be closely fought, and they just haven't really been so far. You know, we've seen some good individual performances, but. You know, they're just just to end like that it is frustrating, and you you want it to be so much more because you know Test cricket is is the pinnacle for me. There's no there's no question there. It's it's the greatest thing any player can do is you know play for their country at a Test level, and it's yeah as I said it's frustrating. It's frustrating to see a, a team that was was once so strong as it were to or as it was sorry as it were as it was to, to struggle a little bit again they're not horrendous but then just not quite what they were or maybe England is just just that bit better right now but it's from this point to see the games end so quickly a lot of people think the wicket at Lords will support a five day test which would be great to see a more closely fought contest uh, later this week uh, just on the on the, the the test selection front, I think Nick Compton is, is seems to be under a little bit of pressure from some people, uh, rightly or wrongly. He's not had the best summer so far. His highest score is forty four. That's for Middlesex. He played four championship games for Middlesex before linking up with England again. His scores in the two tests naught nine and twenty two not out. Uh, granted, in the second test, he didn't really get a lot of chance to do much there, uh, given that that they had to follow on. Uh, and so forth, but it's just it's difficult because England need to, I think, settle a little bit on a top three again. We've kind of had this problem for for a couple of years now. Yeah, you know, arguably since Strauss went, that they didn't really know what to do at opener to partner Alistair Cook, and that was a big topic last summer with Adam Live. And, and I, again, it was something I wrote about, hoping they'd give Live, you know, the full summer and give him a chance and yeah, maybe he'll get another look again but they've gone through guys too you know a little bit too quickly a little bit too prematurely Compton was arguably one of them who who was dropped too quickly he regained his place during the winter tour but Sam Robson again is having another good year for Middlesex he's a, another guy you think maybe is forgotten um Hales was one that that I wasn't sure about when he first got selected for the test side simply because I wasn't sure if his technique was solid enough for the test arena but He's looked okay so far. There's still room for improvement, and hopefully England will give him time as well. Because, as I said, that it's no secret they need to try and find a settled top three. There's talk of maybe looking at Scott Borthwick up in Durham, but I think Compton will probably get the rest of the summer, uh, especially if England are winning. You know, winning tends to paper over some of these issues, and, and we've seen that before. But there are guys out there. James Vince is in the side now as well, who, who's someone a, a few people, myself included, have been keen to see in an England shirt for some time so a big swimmer for him as well to prove he should be there and he's a viable member of, of that middle order so interesting to see how he does as well he, he's looked okay um, not set the world alight as such yet but he, you know he's looked okay I think he'll get get a chance to you know show what he can do through through the summer and, and then they'll reassess come the winter tour maybe or, or hopefully he'll get the whole the whole shebang and then they'll 
look again maybe next summer and, and say, well, you know, what's worked over the last 12 months, what hasn't, and, and so forth. But consistency is the, probably the word I could have used at the start of this entire little rant or diatribe or whatever you want to call it. But uh, uh, just a little couple of other pieces on the test side before I wrap up this inaugural episode. Uh, Australia and South Africa to play a day-night test in Adelaide in November, the second one, which is interesting, I, I think, both from a curiosity point of view still at this stage because it's so very new, um, but also for what it means for the all of Test cricket moving forward. Now, could we support day-night tests in England? Yeesh. That's the tough bit. I, I think you've probably got more confidence in Adelaide having the climate and the weather to support a day-night test than you would say London or Cardiff or Headingley or Trembridge or wherever. Um, you know, because as I speak at the moment, it's dry, cloudy, but dry. You know, it's been a warm day, so it's cooled off now, but you could theoretically play you know, day-night cricket in, in this weather, but then tomorrow it, it may be a down. Yeah, and that's the bit. And, and, you know, does this ever move beyond being a curio... How do they structure it? And how does it fit in with other aspects, which I'll touch on in a in a moment, to do with with Test championships and things? Because you know, does it affect a result in the way that we've seen some one day games, where if you bat second in the lights, it is almost inherently much harder. You know, does that affect anything in in the Test arena? And if you end up being the team batting second and fourth, how does that affect affect your chances of winning the game? Um, excuse me while I have a swig of my ale and yeah it, just all those sort of little questions uh, again it's it's only about the second or, or maybe even third I think it's still the second day night test they've done so it's still very new uh, and but all these questions need to be kind of considered I think because if you're going to continue with this experiment then it has to be for a reason you know you don't just do it for the sake of doing it you should do things like this because they lead somewhere uh, so that'd be interesting. Same goes for the proposed two-tier test uh, setup. I, I'd like to touch on this a bit more with uh, with a guest in, in a coming episode because I'm hopefully going to get some some pretty good guests lined up. I've spoken to a few people already to see if they'd be available, and so far so good. Most people have been very positive and, and said they they'd love to hop on. So thank you to to those of you I've already spoken to, uh, and obviously I'll, I'll look to get things set up in the future for everybody listening at home uh, and hopefully things can grow and morph and, and so forth as time goes on but uh, yeah the, the test thing the test uh, the two tier test thing is, is interesting again I'd rather discuss it a little bit more length uh, on another time but it, it's something that has my curiosity and I can see the pros and cons of it uh, and as I said I'd rather dedicate a full episode to it rather than racing through it now in, in this sort of inaugural uh you know, stray of words. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to put it, but uh, that's probably a, a, as good an indicator as any that I, I should wrap this one up. So thank you for joining me on episode one of the One Stump Short podcast. Uh, you can find the blog, onestumpshort.wordpress.com. There'll be some more written stuff on there throughout the summer, some interviews, and of course all the information on where to find the podcast will appear on there as well. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with one Stump Short, you can email onestumpshort at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at robmcgregor35, or you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash onestumpshort. And on that note, I will leave you. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll speak to you all again very soon.